are in an I Am series. So we looked at what Jesus, uh, what the Bible had to say about Jesus, what the early disciples had to say about Jesus, and now specifically we're going to look a little, we are looking a little bit more on what Jesus has to say about himself. He made roughly seven I am statements in the book of John, and the last of those statements is here in John chapter 15 where Jesus says, I am the vine. And so we're going to pray over our message and over our hearts and our minds this morning, and then we're just going to jump right in. So let's, let's pray. Lord, we approach you now at this point um, in our, our fellowship time, and we just ask that you remove distractions from our mind, that you clear our judgment, Father, that you open up our hearts to receive your word. We thank you for your word. We thank you for not just the testimony that Jesus has given, but the inspired testimony uh, through the Holy Spirit that was given through the minds and the pens of men that you chose, Lord. You elected for service. We thank you for them. Father, we ask now that you uh, give us the ability to reason and to exercise sound judgment so that we can rightly divide your word. Father, we love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, uh, so here we are in this I Am series where Jesus is teaching his disciples, and just kind of set a little bit of a background for you. Jesus is, um, is teaching his disciples during what's called the Last Supper. And so these John chapter 13 through 17 gives us a huge chunk of the Last Supper story that we don't get in the other accounts. And so John really gives us some great detail and information about a- what actually took place. When they went to this upper room, that's where they had their suppers. They would actually go upstairs and they would have this upper room where they would dine. The disciples entered in the room and Jesus had a towel there and he wanted to wash their feet. He wanted to serve them, which was a great sign of humility. And so they enter this room, Jesus washes their feet, they have their, uh, their feast, their meal, and then Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper. And if you look at the end of John chapter 14, the very last verse, it says, at that point, they got up to leave. So if you could imagine having this incredible meal, Jesus has dismissed Judas, who is going to betray him, and he says, go do what you must do and do it quickly. And so Judas is left, and you have 11 disciples with Jesus. They have this incredible meal together, and now they get up because Jesus is going to pray. He's going to go to the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, He's going to sweat drops of blood. He's going to pray to God, and he's going to be arrested, and he's going to be uh, in in prison. He's going to be persecuted, and he's going to go through one of the most horrific things that you could ever imagine. But on the way there, as he's walking through the streets of Jerusalem, Jesus is teaching them, which I think is incredible. He's always teaching. And so he teaches them this. He says, I am the vine, and you are the branches. Now, I don't know if you, being in the 21st century, we are really kind of removed from the cultural impact that this would have had. We are removed from the doctrinal impact that this would have had upon his disciples. And so we have to put ourselves in their mindset. We have to understand what Jesus meant when he said, I am the vine and you are the branches. My grandfather had a farm and he had some cattle. He, he owned like about 20 acres. And I have some of the best memories that I've ever had being at grandpa's house. Uh, in the wintertime, we would sled ride down this huge hill. In the summertime, we would roam like a bunch of crazy people. Uh, we would go chase the cows and they would run after us. And it was this really sick, twisted game that we would play. We got hurt a lot. Uh, we would go jump. We called it a crick, okay? I'm from Ohio. It's a crick, not a creek. I don't know if you're from Ohio. Most of you aren't, but that's what we call it. And we would jump in and we would have a lot of fun. Well, one of the things that we would do every summer is we would go pick wild berries, blackberries and raspberries. And in fact, hands down, my favorite jam is black raspberry jam. Anybody else? I actually had some last night. I've been trying to go no sugar, but I was wanting something sweet. And so, voila, it was right there. Delicious. Put it on some toast. I only had <coughs> four pieces, but uh, that's not what we're talking about this morning. So we would go, we would pick these berries, and, um, and we would get blackberries and, and red berries, and we would put them together, and it was kind of like a hunt. You know, you would go out and you would try to find them. Well, every year, the, the berries, the bushes would continue to grow, and it wouldn't produce as much of a crop because the bush is what's getting big, not necessarily the fruit on the berries. And so you would have to trim them back, and before you know it, if you, did, if you weren't careful about how you trimmed or pruned the bush, it would grow out of control because all the nutrients would go to the bush and not the plant. And that's kind of what Jesus is going to be talking about here in John chapter 15. Let, let's read this passage of scripture together. Starting in verse 1, Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. 
Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, and you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up. And they gather them together, and they cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit. So prove to be my disciples. Just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken so that, you, uh, so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be made full. Now, as I said, our culture is somewhat removed from the impact that this kind of metaphor would have had. Uh, the, the, the vine, the, the wine in the, in the times would have been something that was extremely relevant to them. I mean, that was one of the greatest luxuries of their time was to have grapes. They would make juice from it and raisin cakes and raisins and they would make wine. I mean, it was an absolute luxury of their time. And so this is something that was used over and over and over again to speak spiritual truths to the community. And not just in the ancient religions as well, but also directly related to Israel. In fact, over and over again, God viewed Israel as this plant that he put down in the garden, and it was a vine, and it grew grapes, and it was supposed to bring fruit. It was supposed to produce and be fruitful. The problem with the nation of Israel is that it didn't do what God intended it for, for it to do. It didn't bear fruit. And so God at times throughout Israel's history would actually would have to prune them. Same thing with a plant, right? And this is kind of what I was telling you about a, a blackberry bush. If you let a grape plant grow and you never prune it back, the bush will begin to overwhelm where the grapes should be, and next thing you know, all you've got is a bunch of dead wood. You have a big bush, and part of it would die, especially the under part. And you'd have all this dry, rotted out bush, and you would have no grapes. And of course, if the point is to grow grapes, that's what you want to avoid. And so in the winter time, the farmer would cut off the dead branches, and he would bundle them together, and he would throw them away to burn them so that the next year the vines could grow and it could produce more and more fruit. And so Jesus here is using this motive of the vineyard, and this was a common motive. And let me, let me share with you, for instance, in Psalm chapter 80, verses 7 through 9 and 14 through 17, the Bible talks about this great vine, this great vineyard, and God being a vine dresser. It says, O God of hosts, restore us. And cause your face to shine upon us, that we will be saved. You removed a vine from Egypt, and you drove out the nations, and you planted it. You cleared the ground before it, and took a deep root and filled the land. And then in verse 14, he says, O God of hosts, turn again now, we beseech you. Look down from heaven and see, and take care of this vine. In other words, this guy who's crying out, the psalmist writer is saying, Take care of us, God, your plant that you planted and cleared the way. And bad things have happened, but God, we're asking you to come back. He goes on to say this, Even the shoot which your right hand has planted... And on the Son whom you have strengthened for yourself. It is burned with fire. It is cut down. They perish at the rebuke of your countenance. Let your hand be upon the man of your right hand. Upon the Son of Man whom you made strong for yourself. So if you can imagine it like this. Israel had been punished several times by God. But they always looked out to this distant future of this vine that God would plant and the roots would grow so very deep that he would be called the son of man. He would be the right hand of God. He would be the unique one that would bring blessings. It would be a vine that never would end, that would never die, that would never be uh, able to be rebuked or thrown away, but that would be firmly planted. And that was looking forward to Jesus. It's on the backdrop of Israel's consistent failures that Jesus establishes himself in John 15 as the great I am. In other words, he's saying, I 
and going to bring good fruit. When everyone else has failed you, I am the vine that Israel will always pointed towards. And so if you don't have the deep root, if you don't have the vine, if you don't have the one that makes everything grow, you're going to die and you're going to be burned up. You become a useless branch is what he's teaching here. D.A. Carson writes this in his commentary. He says, if they, being physical Israel, wish to enjoy the status of being a part of God's chosen vine, they must be rightly related to Jesus. And so it doesn't come to a surprise for us as we read this passage that the main emphasis that we see in this passage of Scripture is the word remain. Jesus says, if you remain in me, I will remain in you. Remain connected to the vine. And he goes on to say, remain in my love. And so this morning, if I could have you walk away with something, it would be this. What do I need to do to remain connected to the vine that I may produce fruit and bring glory to God? What do I need to do to remain connected to the vine to produce fruit that I may bring glory to God? The goal is to be an effective, fruitful disciple. And the only way to accomplish this is to be connected to the vine. Now, Jesus isn't teaching on farming here, right? Uh, That's not what you came here for this morning. You don't want to learn about grapes and bushes and how to make things grow. But we can't bypass this powerful metaphor to bring the spiritual reality into our own lives. That Jesus, first of all, the first thing he does is he identifies the characters in this parable or in this metaphor. First of all, he says this, I am the true vine. Unlike the counterfeit Israel, unlike the counterfeit vines that you see throughout the world. I am the true vine. I do not die. I will not go away. And it is absolutely essential for you to remain connected to me. Commentators Bryant and Krauss note this, Jesus is pushing his disciples to see that their future does not lie within the national vine of Israel, but with the genuine vine of Christ. It no longer mattered if you were a physical descendant of a Jew Because the whole point of Israel was to bring about the Messiah. Now the only thing that matters is whether or not you're connected to the true vine. We don't want to knock off, in other words. I am ashamed to admit, uh, I am ashamed to admit, yeah, that's right, that I have bought knockoff DVDs before. Okay? Not going to lie, confession time. Back when I was 17 years old, we would go to New York City. Uh, My mom did some traveling medical work. And so when she was stationed in New York City, I took several trips there. And we had a blast. I mean, it was a lot of fun going to New York. One of our favorite parts to go to was Chinatown. And down in Chinatown, my mom liked to buy the knockoff purses. I I don't get it. I don't know why. And I like to buy the knockoff watches and DVDs, okay? It's because I'm a loser. Uh, I was. I was. I don't do that. And I'm sorry if you do that today. I'm not saying you're a loser, but it's, it, it, it's, it's kind of lame. I mean, come on, let's be honest. So anyways, we go, we go down to Chinatown to buy these. And, and here's the thing. They break, okay? After six months, they break. They don't work. And this is going to kind of bring home the, the story here. But anyway, so in Chinatown, you know, decided for some reason to, get, to buy stuff, you know, off the street. And so you go back into these little hidden rooms that they have. They got to make sure you're not a cop because the cops are patrolling the streets, you know? And so we go back in these little rooms, and it opens up. There's all kinds of stuff in there. And there's these knockoff DVDs. And the thing is, they're movies that have just been released in the movie theater. Pretty awesome. Don't have to go to the movie. I'll watch them at home. And so me, being a 17-year-old moron who's naturally trusting of people, I decided to buy these knockoff DVDs. And they look great. The, they came in these little nice DVD folders. They were saran-wrapped with plastic, as if that couldn't be faked. And so I, I took them. And when I got home... Popped the DVD in, wanted to watch it, and I couldn't even tell what was on the screen. And it obviously looked like it was recorded with like a 1980 reel, you know what I mean? It was blurry, you couldn't see anything, and so it was a complete waste of money. It was a total knockoff, and I hope I don't get arrested for buying a $3 DVD from somebody in the Chinatown, like, you know, when I was 17, but it's a knockoff. It's not even close to being the real thing. So I've totally wasted my money, right? Even though it wasn't that much, it was a complete waste of money because it's counterfeit. It's a knockoff. It's not the real thing. And when Jesus comes, he wants you to be an authentic follower of God. And the only way to accomplish that is to be real. Authenticity is something that I value. It's something that I strive for. I want to be who I am. The same person that's up here on the stage is the same person, if not a little crazier, that you're going to find Monday through Friday. What you see up here is what you get. I am just me. And that's what I try to be. And that's who Jesus was. He was authentic. 
And the only way to have an authentic relationship with God is to be connected with Jesus. And so Jesus says, I am the vine. I am the one that was promised in the Old Testament. And I am the one you have to be connected to. He goes on to say in verse 1, he identifies his father. He says, my father, God the father, is the vine dresser. The farmer's responsibility, the vine dresser's responsibility was to work the soil and prune back the dead branches. In fact, even the branches, as we'll see, that was able to produce fruit, he would often prune those back as well so that it could produce even more fruit. And we'll get to that here in a few moments. But Jesus goes on to say here in verse 2, he says, Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. He throws out the knockoffs. He gets rid of the DVDs that you can't see on the, on the TV screen. The things that aren't real, they're fake. It's disingenuous. And he says he removes them. It's because in the vineyard, the farmer's task is to clean the vine and cut away the dead branches. And as we'll see here in a few minutes, the reason why that's important is because the dead, dried up branches begin to affect, affect the ability for the fruitful branches to produce. And so God does make the hard decision at times. He does cut dead branches off because God is interested in his kingdom being successful. And he really doesn't have the ability to carry dead weight in that sense, if that makes sense. And remember, we're using a metaphor here. And look what he says here. He says he takes them away. This word can also mean he cleans, he prunes. It's the same word used in John chapter 19 verse 31 where they took away the dead body of Jesus. They took it off the cross. And so it is a complete removal here. But notice something unique. Notice what he says, that these branches, where are they located in verse 2? He says, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. There seems to be a genuine connection. What's the problem? What's the problem with this branch? It's connected to the vine. The problem, he says, is it does not bear fruit. It fails to produce the good works of discipleship. We, as disciples, the 12 disciples, well, actually 11 at this point, were elected for service, and Jesus is warning them in this moment, your purpose is to bear fruit. And if you don't bear fruit, if you don't do that which God has elected you to do, election for service, you've become a useless branch. All you're doing is sucking out the nutrients of the plant, Those nutrients that should be going to the fruit are now selfishly focused on yourself, the branch. And sooner or later, you're going to be cut off, and you're going to dry up, and you'll be nothing good other than to be thrown away, to make fire, in other words. And so their works of discipleship really ultimately demonstrate the attitude of their heart. Jesus says in Matthew 12, 33, you will know a tree by its fruit. If you want to look at whether or not a tree is healthy and it produces fruit or what kind of fruit it produces, look at the fruit that's on the branches and you're going to be able to tell what kind of tree that is. If you want to know what kind of Jesus follower you are or what kind of Jesus follower somebody else is, it's simple. Look at the fruit. What are the actions, the attitudes, and the outcomes of their lifestyle? What is the outcome of their choice that they make day in and day out? Can you look to people? Can you even look to yourself and say, look at the fruit that my life has produced. I am an authentic follower of Jesus. I really do follow him. Why? Because my life reflects his commands. You see, the the reality is, the danger is this is that a person who doesn't produce fruit has a bigger issue going on. It's a heart issue. It's not that we are saved by works and what we do. That's not the point. The point is that our works reflect the state of our heart, and the state of our heart reflects the state of our mind, our belief, our faith in Jesus. And so if there's a working, fruitful issue going on here, that means there's a belief issue going on here. Look at what Jesus goes on to say in verse 6 about these branches that don't produce fruit. He says, if anyone does not abide in me, he's thrown away as a branch. He dries up. And they gather them together, and they cast them into the fire, and they are, bo- and then they are burned. Ultimately, what this reflects is a disloyal life. Man, I was so disappointed. I went to Home Depot last summer, and I bought these plants that were supposed to be blueberries. I love blueberries. Blueberries is like 
you know, delicious, man. I could just sit there and I could just pop blueberries in all day long. It's like one of the best fruits that you can eat, thankfully, blessed up, you know what I mean? Because uh, I'm a sweets guy, if you can't tell, and I can eat the, the pants off sweets. I had 13 donuts a few weeks ago. I've gone on a diet since, so don't judge me, okay? You guys know about the Ohio story. We're not getting into that again and, uh, and the other stories about donuts. Somehow donuts always come up in my sermons. I've got a problem. I think, I think I need to go to counseling because I'm obsessed with donuts. But anyways, I love blueberries. I love blueberry flavor. If somebody brings me blueberry jam, not going to reject it. Let's just put it like that. But anyway, so I bought these plants, and they're supposed to be starter plants. So you plant them in the ground, and then next thing you know, you got blueberry plants. So I bought a few. Put them in the ground. I mean, they were these little pathetic things that I was like, there's no way this is actually going to grow. And, but I took a chance, you know, instead of taking it back. And so I put it, and nothing happened. It, there was no fruit that ever came from it, and it was just a pile of dirt. And so I, once again, wasted my money on things that were supposed to produce fruit, but it didn't. Not going to do that again. Not going to buy those plants again. And here's the deal. God has purposed you in your life to produce fruit. And if you're not acting according to the function that he's designed and created you for, are you as useful and as purposeful as what God intended you to be? And if you're not, the question is why? Why aren't you producing the fruit that God has designed and created you to produce? Only you can answer that question. Ultimately, it comes down to this. Disobedience. The lack of producing fruit leads to disbelief. And so that's one of the challenging aspects about living a faithful life, is that if you're not committed to following Jesus with what you do, that will eventually lead to a a belief statement, an attitude, an idea that I no longer believe and accept that Jesus is the Christ. And so hopefully you can see how what you do really does impact what you believe. And hopefully you can also see producing fruit, carrying out that purpose that God has for your life is one of the main essential ingredients to keeping you connected to the vine. When you fail to produce fruit in your life, you begin to dry up. You begin to focus more on yourself. Yeah, your branch may be big. Yeah, people may look at you and say, well, that person is connected to the vine. They go to church, but they don't produce any fruit in their life. And hopefully you're sitting there thinking, okay, I need to produce fruit. I need to produce fruit. Uh, what is the fruit? What does that mean? How do I know if I'm an authentic follower of Jesus? Well, let's look and see what he has to say here. So he just tells his disciples about how he throws away useless branches. Jesus says this, and here's the deal. Being an authentic follower of Jesus, producing fruit, bearing fruit in your life, as one of the most important things that you can do. And the reason why is because, as I said, it does reflect the attitude and state of your heart. And it's the great paradox because when you don't produce fruit, it's a slow fade. It's not as if it happens overnight, and it can. Some people can just say, you know what? I've studied. I don't think that Jesus is the Christ. I'm out of here. I'm gone. I disbelieve. But other people, it happens slowly but surely. You get offended in church. It ceases your involvement. You stop getting disconnected. You start pointing the finger at the church. It's the vine. It's the other branches that are the problem. It's not me. And that slow but sure disobedience of saving your life, of focusing on yourself, starts to drain the nutrients to the fruit, and you start to focus on yourself, and you start to save your life. But Jesus says in Matthew 16, 25, whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. The temptation... To focus on yourself is the death nail in the coffin. If our faith is the fire lit in Christ, our good works is the gas that keeps it going. Without the fire, the gas is nothing but a liquid. But without the gas, the fire will eventually burn out. That's why James said in James 2.24, faith without works is dead. A branch without fruit is useless. Yes, we can say, I believe, I follow Jesus. But if that's never reflected in your attitude and your actions and in your discipleship and sharing your faith, ultimately, can you say, my faith is alive? My faith is vibrant. It's growing. It's producing fruit. Look what Jesus goes on to say here in verse 2. He says, but every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes away so that it may bear more fruit. It is God's desire for your life for you to produce fruit. That's his desire. He wants you to be successful in your Christianity. 
He wants you to be successful in sharing your faith with other people. And God will send, typically, trouble your way. Look, it doesn't feel good to have something cut off, right? I mean, to have something snipped off, that would, that would be like we would consider that injury. Pruning isn't an enjoyable process. And it is through the, the, the method of pruning and discipline that God actually increases our growth. And so maybe you've been disciplined by God. Maybe you have things in your heart and in your mind and in your life that have been troublesome for you and challenging for you. God may be allowing you to go through that because he wants to increase your fruitfulness. He wants you to grow. And tribulation often is the only way that we can do that. Look what he says in verse 3. He says, you disciples. Remember, he's speaking to the disciples. He's not talking to Rick Bonifield here. He's speaking to the disciples that we are applying in principle. He says in verse 3, you are already clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. How are they clean? By the words of Jesus. What does it mean that they are clean? It means they've been properly pruned and they're ready for service. They're ready to produce the spiritual harvest, the results that God intended them to give. He says in verse 4, abide in me and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. Here's the whole point, guys. The point is emphatically clear that the branch must remain connected to the vine or else it will die. You know, the early church, they met at least, we know, the beginning of every week, the Lord's Day. Sunday is what we call it today. And you can find that in the book of Acts. In fact, the early church often met Almost every single day, they ate meals together. They sold their possessions to help out each other. I mean, it was a lifestyle, not just this weekly event. They wanted to remain connected. In fact, in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 25, he says this, Do not forsake the assembling together of yourselves as in the habit of some, but encourage one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. Don't give up. Don't disconnect yourself. Don't sit on the sidelines. Don't think that you can just have undercover Christianity or you can be like a ninja Jesus. You can't sit on the sidelines. The only way to be strong and vibrant and grow is to remain connected to the vine. And so if you are convinced that, man, as long as I just go to church once a week or twice a week or even four times a week and you think that's what's going to be good enough to keep you connected, friends, I'm here to tell you it is not. Being connected to the vine is so much more than just coming to church at 10.30 a.m. on Sunday morning. He says, you must abide in me. Abide means to remain, dwell, live. Here's my personal favorite, to make home. Abide in me. In other words, Jesus is saying, let me be your home. Let me be your family. He says in John 14, 23, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our abode, our home with him. God wants you to be a part of this family. He wants you to be connected to his son, Jesus. And look at what Jesus says in verse four, a branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. So neither can you unless you abide in me. It is a lie from Satan. If you are convinced that I've got to be good enough before I can be the person that God wants me to be, that somehow I've got to muster up my own energy, my own good works, my own ability before I can become a Christian. Somehow I've got to get my life straightened out and figured out and stop doing bad stuff and start doing good stuff before I'm allowed to be connected to the vine. That is the exact opposite of what Jesus is teaching. He's saying, you can't do this without me. You can't get a head start. You can't produce the fruit that God wants you to produce without remaining connected to me. It starts with me. It doesn't end with me. When I was in Jamaica, this was a very prominent, I went on a few mission trips, very prominent idea in the community that I am not allowed in church because my life is a mess. That's the exact opposite of the gospel. The church is a place of messy people where we're trying to get it all figured out together. And man, we can't do this without Jesus. So don't be tricked into thinking you can become good enough. Get connected to the vine first. And look how he makes this emphatically clear in verse 5. He says, for apart from me, you can do nothing. In other words, Jewish disciples, your ability to be fruitful is not wrapped up in your lineage. It's not about your social status or how much money you make or whether or not you think that you're a good person or a bad person. Your fruitfulness begins and starts with me, for apart from me, you can do nothing. 
So Jesus wants us to be fruitful, and he gives us three ways that we can do that in verses 7 through 9. Let's look at those three descriptions together. He says, first of all, if you abide in me, in verse 7, if you do the things that I've commanded, look what he says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, do what I've asked, abide in my words, that is the word of God. This is the only place that you can get the words and the sayings of Jesus. And all of it is inspired, not just the red letters, okay? All of it is the word of God. And so Jesus wants you to remain. He wants you to make this word your home. This is where you dwell. This is where you live. This is where you get nourishment and food from. And if you're not eating the word every day, you're going to starve yourselves. You're going to dry yourselves up like a dead branch. You've got to be connected to the word. And so Jesus wants us to abide in his words. He wants us to follow his words. And these 12 disciples, if you could imagine, they're walking through the streets, and maybe at this time they have passed a great vineyard. Maybe on their way to the Garden of Gethsemane, they passed um, a vineyard with vines and grapes. And Jesus is saying, you've got to remain attached to me. You've got to abide in my words. They were trained. They were commissioned. Jesus told them, he says, look, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. And so Jesus wants us to be fruitful And so, again, if you're asking yourself this morning, what does it mean to be fruitful? I honestly believe that this passage of Scripture, speaking to the disciples, is not talking about just being a good person. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. I don't think it's talking about the fruit of the Spirit. I think it's talking about the fruit of discipleship, which includes the fruit of the Spirit. Obviously, if you're sharing the gospel with other people, you're going to be living the Christian life that you should be living What is Jesus saying here? If you aren't bearing fruit and sharing your faith with other people, you're not carrying out the intended function that I've given you. The Great Commission in Matthew 28, 18, go into all the world and make disciples. Bear much fruit. And so Jesus isn't teaching, as I said, a salvation by works. In other words, you're not going to heaven or hell based off of whether or not you've converted people to Christianity. But whether or not you're actively producing fruit, are you trying to convert people? Are you trying to disciple people and share people? That is the emphasis. That's the point. Because the promise is you you will bear fruit. That's the promise that Jesus gives his disciples. And so don't try to trick yourself into thinking that because I haven't been as successful, that means I'm not saved. It reflects the attitude and intentions of your heart. If you're not actively trying to be fruitful, what is that saying about Jesus' lordship? What is that saying about your forgiveness that you think that you've received in Jesus? And so he's telling us, if you are going to be an authentic disciple of Jesus, you will follow my words. In verse 8, he says this. Number two, how do, you, how do you have this fruitful life? Well, you must bear much fruit and proving yourself to be my disciples. Now, as I said, this could be talking about a few things. And I've got them up on the screen for you. And one option is this. He could be talking about the fruit of a repentant heart. I don't think that's it. Number two, he could be talking about the fruit of of the Spirit, which is fruit, singular. I don't think that that's it either. He could be talking about the fruit of godly discipline in our lives. While I think that that is part of it, I don't think that that's absolutely everything. Here's the key. The key is this. He says, show yourselves to be my disciples. Authentic discipleship performs deeds of love that validate the disciples' relationship to Christ. And so bearing fruit is a way of demonstrating, not determining, the kind of branch that you are. If you are interested in Jesus' business, you're interested in sharing Jesus with other people. It's really that simple. And if you're sitting there thinking, I have not made a disciple in Lord knows how long. When's the last time I actually had somebody over to my house to share a meal with? When's the last time I opened up the Bible and actually gave the words of Jesus to somebody? When's the last time I imparted my life to another person and I love them on a consistent basis and I imparted my faith and my life to them? It could be your kids. It could be your family. It could be the children's classes. There's really no good excuse to not produce fruit. And so we have a very high standard that Jesus sets here. If you are an authentic follower of me, you will abide in my words and you will produce fruit. You see, a faith that justifies is a faith that works. A disciple who is authentic is a disciple who produces the fruit of discipleship. 
And if we have a fruit problem, it's because we've got an attitude problem. If we've got an attitude problem, it's because we've got a word of God problem. If we've got a word of God problem, it's because we've got a heart problem. And if we have a heart problem, it's because we've got a faith problem. We have a promise that Jesus will bring forth the fruit if we abide in him. And then thirdly, and very, very importantly, he says this. In verse 9, look what he says. Abide in my love. My agape. My self-sacrificialness. How do we do that? Look what he says in verse 10. If you love me, you'll do what? You'll keep my commands. You see, the reason why people don't keep Jesus' commands is because they've taken his forgiveness for granted and they've belittled his lordship. They think that what it means to be a Christian is simply means to stand up in a position to where I am forgiven and that I don't have any responsibility or any response to the cross. And that is completely untrue. The embodiment of love is selflessness. It's sacrificial love. It's a love that is patient and kind and long-suffering. It's a love that does not keep record of wrong. It doesn't rejoice when others fail. It's not arrogant and puffed up. To abide in the love of Christ is to obey his commands. And to obey his commands is to follow the words that we read about in this book. And so I ask you this morning, are you abiding in the love of Jesus? Are you following his teachings? Are you having a fruitful life? Do you produce other disciples? Do you abide in the word? Do you make an honest effort to get in this book every day? Do you have the fruit of a faithful life, somebody who's connected to the vine? And Jesus gives us this great metaphor as we conclude. He says this in verse 10. He says, verse 10 and 11, Just as I have kept my Father's commands and I abide in his love. What's the standard? To be like Jesus. How do we abide in the love of God? Just like Jesus abided in the love of his Father. In other words, Jesus is saying, follow me, obey my commands, just like I follow God and obeyed his commands. And I think that if we do that, we are going to find a cross waiting in our path that we must pick up and carry. I mean, think about it. Do you think it was easy for Jesus to go to the cross? You think it was easy for Jesus to be put in chains and punched and spit in his face? You think it was easy for Jesus to stand before a crowd of his accusers and be falsely accused and not defend himself? Do you know how hard it is not to want to speak up and defend yourself? But yet Jesus says, I've entrusted judgment to the Father, and he remains silent. As a Christian, as a church leader, when people put false accusations on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or send emails and spread lies and rumors, there is nothing more than I want than to defend the church and the integrity of the leadership and the integrity of the cross. But I trust God. It's hard to pick up your cross. It's hard to follow after Jesus. It's hard to remain connected to the vine because I want to focus on the branch. The most happy people that I know make life about others rather than themselves. Jesus made the cross all about us. He followed his father's commands and he made the cross all about us. And I think that you will find when you start putting the energy and effort into the fruit and to the other people and to making disciples, you will find yourselves having uncontrollable joy. You will actually be happy again. And you know what's something that's absolutely true? And if you're not in church, and this is maybe your first time coming back, you might be able to identify with this. Sometimes the most miserable people in the church are the ones who do absolutely nothing. They sit back, they point the finger, and they complain because church is somehow all about me and not about God and other people. The branches that are the most fruitful are the branches that focus on the fruit of other people, not on whether or not church is meeting their needs. And so if you've been here this morning, or if you've gone to another church, or if you've been to our church before and you say, man, that just really didn't meet my needs, you have made yourself the center and the focal point of the branch, rather than the vine and rather than the fruit. How do I... Hallelujah.